Rachel, thanks for uh, taking some time so we can get together again and talk about the condition of our world and the condition that we're in because of the condition of the world. <laughs> um, I'm happy to do it, Walton. It's great to see you. Our last recorded conversation came just a few days before the presidential election oh, back God, in that's November. Right. That's right. Um, was I confidently predicting a Hillary Clinton win? You were. You were. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and we, we had a lot of uh, theories about what was going to happen, but we're not going to replay any of that. But uh, I do remember after the election, uh, a few days after the election, uh, we were texting each other, mm. and you said, how do you feel? And I said, uh, despondent, disappointed, sad and scared, but resigned. And you said, well, that's kind of where I am too. Now, just before the end of the year, we exchanged texts and you wrote these words. I have deep faith 2017 will be more of a hoot than we're expecting. <laughs> Rachel, what happened? <laughs> A hoot, I mean, in a technical sense of that term. That's a, that's a term of art, really. It's a, I'd love to say it was an acronym for something much more, much more deep. I am uh, The energy that I feel for my own work right now is a surprise and a pleasure. Like, we are in a, we are in a dark place as a country, and the health of our republic and our democracy and the uh, example of our government is um, all... In, in pretty bad straits, but um, there's also a lot of work to do mm -hmm. that is energizing. Mm -hmm. I do not feel enervated. I do not feel drained. I do not feel depressed. I feel like, all right, then we were made for this. Like, let's see, let's show everybody what we're made of. So did your show fundamentally change because of the election? No, I don't think it did. I think... Um, my mission in terms of what I'm trying to do with my show is still the same thing. All right, we still have this internal motto, which is to increase the amount of useful information in the world. That's definitely still true. It feels like there's more of an imperative to it maybe than there was before because there's so much going on that's never happened before. So there's more of a hunger for yeah. explanation mm -hmm. and to get something useful in terms of information yeah. about what's going on in the world. Um, I think there's more pressure I think there's more audience. I think there's more appreciation, honestly, mm -hmm. of what it means to have somebody who you trust telling you what's important in the day's news. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel needed. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel like I'm doing anything different than I ever did before. It, it, respond to this, because this is something I think, and I may be wrong about it, but all of the things that you do well, you're, you've still been doing, I have seen you sometimes become like an investigative reporter, hmm. and it's very helpful. I don't know whether you're aware of that or not. Uh, um, I have way too much respect for investigative reporters to put myself in their category, <laughs> yeah. but um, and it's and it's interesting. I've, been, I've I've I think I've received more more credit for that than I deserve from a number of people. Hmm. Um, there have been some stories that we've broken that where we've somebody's right. leaked something to us or we've obtained we've obtained information that other people didn't have. I definitely have, you know, I work sources every day and mm -hmm. we reporting is part of what we do. But most of what I do that I think has excited people in sort of that direction has been taking other people's journalistic work and connecting it, mm -hmm. remembering stuff that applies to the same scenario, remembering what that person was also mentioned in conjunc conjunction with, tying, you know, for example, Rex Tillerson's former life and mm -hmm. his deal-making past at Exxon mm -hmm. with his, with the Russia investigation and with the uh, with his role as Secretary of State. That's not investigative per se. It's expository. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and maybe sometimes there's a there's thin line between those things. Yeah. Um, but I'm no I'm no Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> you know I'm, I'm no I'm no Michael Isakoff out um, digging this stuff up from between the cracks. But I I, I do think that um, I've always seen myself as kind of an explainer, mm -hmm. and 
there's a lot of complicated stuff out there that needs explaining every day. So that's what well, we do. When, when you go on the air, uh, what do you want to happen? What, what do you want those who listen to you and see you, what do you want to happen in them? I want to try to focus people's attention on stories that are more important rather than less important, that are more substantive and less manufactured distraction, mm -hmm. that are more meaningful and less diverting. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, um, like everybody who works in this business, everybody who gets is the, has the blessing to control an hour of TV mm -hmm. has to decide what they're going to cover every day, what they're not going to cover, and what explanatory device and um, energy they're going to they're going to bring to it and I'm I'm trying to sort of it's a little bit weird to say it but I feel like the negative space of my show has become really important like mm. I'm not going to talk about misstatements in the briefing room yeah. I'm not going to talk about outrageous provocations from the president on social media mm -hmm. I'm not going to play media wars where I get into fights with other people who do this type of media work mm -hmm. but from a different angle like I don't just don't you can all there's plenty of places to do do all that instead I think this is what's important in terms of what we learned from the last 24 hours of a news cycle mm -hmm. that focusing role um, I think is my the thing I'm I I'm, I care the most about right now when I get on the air. And that's the hardest to do because it requires the most original thought. Okay, that's where you are. I'm, I'm curious as to how you see the nation. Did the nation fundamentally change after this election? I think our politics changed a little bit. I mean, the Republican Party um, got a leader that doesn't make sense with its uh, in, in light of its past and its professed ideals. So they have had to adjust themselves as a party. People who don't like the new president um, or don't like the direction that he represents for the country have discovered a new civic involvement, civic awareness, mm -hmm. civic engagement that is as profound, is, is potentially as profound a change in the public as, uh, uh, as, as Trump is a change to our politics. Mm -hmm. And that is a very big, powerful force that's been really interesting to cover. And that was, that was another one of these things where uh, it didn't help to just sort of watch what the Beltway thought was important because right. they were missing what was going on in like Idaho town yeah. halls that, yeah. you, you know, red state America and in the, uh, you know, when indivisible Ozarks formed and all of a sudden mm -hmm. Tom Cotton was having to answer questions in unexpected ways about mm -hmm. Donald Trump's tax returns or Russia, whatever it was. Um, it's sort of a, you know, take the blinders off, eyes wide open moment because a lot of unexpected stuff is happening and it's not always coming from the expected places. Yeah. Has partisanship on steroids <laughs> uh, become a detriment to good government? Yeah, but that's always been, that's always been true. I think, um, you know, well, and I, th I think... I've done a lot of, I've focused a lot on the Russia story, on the Russia attack on our election and the question and the investigation into whether or not the Trump campaign was part of it, whether mm -hmm. they were in on it. And therefore, the presidency is, you know, the product of a foreign intelligence operation. Mm -hmm. right? And I have focused a lot on that. And some people have given me grief for focusing on that too much. <clears throat> but that, to me, is a different kind of scandal. Mm -hmm. And it's a different kind of political problem when it comes to partisanship, because we expect partisanship to gum up the works on mm -hmm. all sorts of different kinds of policy disputes and ethics matters, and even on questions of war and peace to a certain mm -hmm. degree. But we do not expect partisanship to gum up the works when it comes to the idea of a foreign attack on our country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there are very many elected officials in the country. I don't think there are many hardcore partisans in the country who will pick party over country if it comes to the worst case scenario in these revelations about the campaign. If it turns out that, if, if the worst case scenario proves out 
<laughs> I have faith that partisanship will crumble in the face of that national security emergency. Now, I may be proven wrong, mm -hmm. um, but it, to me, that is going to be a test of whether we are dealing with a more virulent form of, mm -hmm. more virulent and, and evil form of partisanship than we've ever dealt with when dealing with other normal scandals and, and policy disputes. Has, has your attentiveness to the Russian stories uh, mm -hmm. and all of the characters that have been players in that, have, has that caused you to miss any other critical issues? Well, I mean, there's an opportunity cost to everything. Every time you cover one thing, it means you can't spend that time covering something else. But I don't have... I don't feel like there's stuff I want to be covering that I don't have time to cover. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm blessed. I have the best job on earth. I get paid to talk on TV about what I want to without editorial interference from anybody. Yeah. Uh, five nights a week, 50 weeks a year. And... Um, so I'm, uh, my editorial independence is something that I prize and I don't have regrets about what we've chosen right. to focus on. I also think, you know, once you decide you're not going to cover the White House's statements, yeah. that frees up a lot of airtime. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a weird decision. Yeah. I remember the first White House briefing of the new administration, watching the whole thing and being like, <laughs> like this is never really the White House briefing room has never been used like this before like we've got Goober yeah. and then to suddenly come to the realization that I mean after you cover the initial story that the president is saying things that are not true the White House spokesman is saying stuff that is not true the White House is putting out written statements that are not true the White House is making available for live interview people who work at senior levels in the White House who will then in live interviews say things that are not true they will not correct things when they are confronted about the fact that they are not true like that was a big sort of what this administration is going to be like initial story but at some point that can't be the story of every day. You just have to absorb that information. All right, they're not telling the truth. And then you have to use that information. And once somebody has proven to you that they are not telling the truth, that they lie regularly and don't feel bad about it even when they're caught, mm -hmm. that is freeing because that means you are excused from ever having to listen to that person ever again in terms of trying to get factual information. So, so much of the reporting model of how news is collected in this country Network news, cable news, all of it, print media, everything, is about getting factual information from public officials. Mm -hmm. And you can still do that from anonymous career public servants who can't give you their name because they'll be fired for speaking out. Mm -hmm. But you can't get factual information from named officials of the Trump administration. You really can't. Yeah. And so don't. Don't, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't try. Don't your time. And that, um, that frees up. It, once you stop covering what they say and just start covering what they do, you have more time to get to the good stuff. I want to talk about a word that I don't associate with you at all, uh, just the opposite, uh, and, and that's this word fake, fake news. Mm -hmm. um, I never would associate that with you, but I would like for you to talk for a minute or so about how fake news, that whole thing, is affecting the way people deal with media. And I'd also like you to talk about, with our listeners, uh, how can we know what's fake and what's authentic? Mm -hmm. I feel like that phrase is more an epithet than a label. Mm -hmm. There's nothing intrinsic about a particular piece of reporting um, that, uh, you know, a particular piece of real reporting mm -hmm. that tells you whether or not it's going to be called fake news. You know, mm -hmm. nobody's earning that. Nobody in the real news media who's, who's, who's writing factual information is earning that moniker. It's just thrown as an epithet mm -hmm. um, by the supporters of the administration and sometimes by the president himself as a way to discount um, and insult news they don't like. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it operates on a couple of levels. All presidents hate the media. Yeah. Um, some of them do it with uh, more vigor than others. <laughs> I mean, Barack Obama used to frequently talk about how bad cable news was and how he never watched it and it was terrible for America. And he would, you know, lump 
MSNBC and with Fox News, like we were all equally evil. Uh, okay, you know, thanks, Mr. President. Cheers. <laughs> you know, I didn't appreciate that either. Uh, he never called the pre- the press the enemy of the state, um, mm-hmm. nor did he you know, berate and insult individual news outlets uh, for sport among mm-hmm. his among his supporters. Um, so it's operating at a couple different levels. They, I, I think they want to, this is their particular way of waging war in the press. But the other part of it is the Russia story. Mm-hmm. I mean, the way that Russia attacked our election was twofold. They had what appears to have been a covert action by mostly military intelligence sources to hack information out of the U.S political system, specifically mostly out of the Democratic Party, a little bit out of the Clinton campaign. And then they turned that information around, released it in a way that was sort of weaponized to make the most damage in our system. The other thing they did was they used Russian state-run media outlets and also social media to invent false stories um, or to circulate partially true, mostly false stories in ways that were most damaging to the Clinton campaign and would help the Trump folks the most. They really did make stuff up. There really was fake news, stuff that mm-hmm. did not come from a news background at all. It was in, it was created wholesale to have a political effect in this foreign intelligence operation. That really did happen in the campaign by essentially turning that around saying, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say sticks to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're trying to neutralize that critique of how Russia attacked the election. And that is something I think we can't really let them get away with. Before you ever go on the air, when you're dealing with a story, uh, how do you decide whether this is authentic or questionable? It's the same way we've always done it. I mean, I was talking earlier about how I have editorial independence. I get to talk about what I want. Um, I have a deal with, my deal with MSNBC from the beginning has always been they will not tell me what to cover what not to cover or how to cover anything that I cover. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also agree that I will abide by NBC News rules and standards Mm -hmm. in terms of what we put on the air. And that has all sorts of very specific logic in terms Mm -hmm. of, you know, things needing to be double sourced. There needing to be transparency about the sourcing of things when we are working from other people's reporting that has not been independently corroborated by NBC News. We Mm -hmm. cite the named source of the reporting. We state overtly if we've got any concerns or even things of interest to note about the sourcing of that material. Mm -hmm. I mean, the solution on this, it's like free speech. The solution is more of it. Um, Be transparent. Say where this news came from. Say what the origin of it was. Um, And when you've done that, it means that other people can reproduce your work or at least decide for themselves Mm -hmm. whether or not that sourcing seems true to them. Um, I think there's more and more pressure because of this epithet, this fake news epithet Mm -hmm. being thrown around. There's more and more pressure for people to identify sources by name or position or the means by which they would have access to this information that they are leaking about. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's good. I mean, anonymous sources is not a healthy thing. So... um, I just feel like people need to get really aggressive in terms of explaining what makes real news real news. What should we be most interested in seeing what happens now? What hmm. what what are you looking at? Uh, what should our listeners be looking at in the days immediately ahead? I think there are two things that I am sort of most on the edge of my seat about, both as a citizen and as a person who's interested in the news. One of them is, will there be consequences? Will we return to political norms and to what we previously understood as the sort of rules of the game when it comes to base corruption? Mm -hmm. So when you've got somebody working as a regulatory advisor to the White House who is making recommendations to change regulations that will affect his own investments, that's not OK. When you've got people who are working on behalf of the White House, bringing in CEOs to the White House for meetings that will affect the value of those companies. It turns out that official owns stock in those companies. Mm-hmm. When you've got somebody who's got a position of power in the legislature overseeing, in Tom Price's case, overseeing healthcare companies, and he's buying and selling stock in healthcare companies and then... Yeah. 
writing and co-sponsoring legislation that affects the price of those companies he holds stock in. Like, there's really base level corruption stuff, even beyond the issues of the conflict of interest with the the family, the Trump family, and him bringing his children into high government posts. I am, as a citizen and as a news watcher, very interested to see whether or not there will be accountability for base level corruption. Because if not, if our if we're just throwing our mores out the window on mm-hmm. that, if we're just going to become like Uzbekistan on this stuff, we're, that's a that's something that's very, very hard to recover from. Mm-hmm. Once you let that stuff slide, you've set precedent. That's bad. Mm-hmm. The other thing is the investigations into the Russia thing. Mm-hmm. We know a lot about what Russia did. The piece of it that we don't know is whether or not the campaign that won the election was helping. And that is going to be an existential question when it finally gets answered. Be a viewer uh, for a moment. And you're watching television. What makes you want to scream at the television (laughs) set? What what makes you angry? Uh, What 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 is it you're feeling that's churning that and and where does that come from on what you're seeing on television? (laughs) Mostly, well, you know me well enough to know that if I am watching television, it's probably football. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's probably New England. Yeah, exactly. I know. (laughs) Now everybody's screaming at the radio, New England. I know. (laughs) I know. Um, I try not to absorb too much. I try not to absorb too much of um, content that is similar to what I create Uh um, because in part I don't want to inadvertently steal from people. So I don't watch other people who do the kind of work that I do. At least I don't watch them very much because I don't want to accidentally ape yeah. what other people are doing. So, oop, sorry, I hit my microphone there. Um, that's part of it. Uh, in terms of the my frustrations with the way the news is being covered right now, I do get frustrated when people uh, treat the administration, even the president himself, as if he can be trusted to provide you factual information. Mm -hmm. When the White House rebuts an otherwise well-reported story and insists Mm -hmm. that something isn't true, that is an interesting fact about the White House that they are insisting that it's not true, but that doesn't actually count as a factual Mm -hmm. confirmation or or, or denial. Um, So, and that that to me is, I I want there to be, I think they have, I think this White House has earned healthy skepticism when it comes to their factual assertions. And it frustrates me when 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 reporters uh, or anchors, even people consuming the news, treat them uh, as if they have credibility. What kind of emotions or thoughts do you have that you can't say on national television? <laughs> that I would still be willing to say into this <laughs> microphone? <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Oh, I try the best I can. <laughs> exactly. Will you tell me a secret? <laughs> no. No. Listen. I mean, I'm in a. I, I'm in a. I. I really feel like we were made for this. We were made mm-hmm. for this. And when you have a an organism system body of some kind that is shocked, you don't just study the shock. You study the organism. You study the body. You study the system to see how it responds to that shock. It tells you a lot about the health of that system and its resilience to see how it copes. And I think the way that we are coping as a country, we're, we're learning a lot about the resilience of our republic. And there's, you know, multiple articles in the, mm-hmm. in, in the Constitution. And um, I'm very, very proud to be part of the press corps in this country right now, given the very, very good work that has happened thus far um, in terms of ferreting out the truth about this administration that they don't want known. And, you know, we're, we're going to have to be strong and nimble and resilient, and we need to take care of ourselves. And we're at a time when we're confronted by a very, very, very radical um, change at the top. And if we have stuff that we want to stand up for and defend, we're going to have to be good at it. And I, I relish the challenge and I feel like, well, all right, now we know what the fight of our lives is. Maybe we didn't know before, but now we know. Uh, the next question I want to ask you, if I didn't ask it, you knowing me as you do, you'd say, what in the world is wrong with you? But I, I, I want to uh, ask you about 
the Johnson Amendment yeah. and what the president is saying about that. I know uh, you're one of the few people I know uh, that cares as much about religious freedom as people at the Interfaith Alliance hmm. care um, and that, that all of us care. Um, we went through this in D.C. Uh, a few years ago, a really harsh battle on this same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Interfaith Alliance was right at the front of it, and we, that time, were successful in getting it put away. Now, this time, the president uh, seems to think that is the gift he owes the religious right, um, despite the fact that uh, it will hurt religion yeah. uh, far more than it would ever help it. Um, have you ever heard anybody make a succinct and effective defense of doing what the president wants to do? Well, his argument is that it's a, it's a free speech argument, right? Sort of. He's saying unless people can endorse from the pulpit and funnel money to political candidates, they're being oppressed. On... But they can, Rachel. They, yeah. they can do that. All they have to do is give up uh, their tax taxes. Exemption, tax right? exemption. And he would dis he has described that, and the people who are egging him on about this stuff would describe that as, a, uh, as an assault on free speech. I mean, you can't really describe it as an assault on religious liberty, right? Um, although... They would. They talk talk about I'm rubber, you're glue. <laughs> turning, <laughs> absolutely. Turning it, turning absolutely. it up, that inside out. I mean, the thing for me, the thing that I I don't know how they answer is what we can all imagine about how this would work in practice, right? If a congregation become, if congregations of any kind anywhere in the country become a place that corporations or rich people or regular Americans can, in a tax-free way, funnel money through those institutions without paying taxes on them to, in turn, have make political donations. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that will be what churches are. That will be what religion is for in this country. And it will money reshape. It will reshape the landscape of religion in America. Yes. Totally. Yes. And it will divide congregations across the board and what church means, what the mosque means, what the temple means will change. Yeah. Totally. And as if people don't self-segregate enough on political lines in their congregations, you know? I yeah. mean, you talk yeah. about we'd essentially have, I mean, you'd have literally Republican yeah. temples and Democratic temples and, and, and the pressure... I mean, imagine the, um, the, for, the, for the family deciding where it's comfortable to worship, if your money is part of how you make it clear to your congregation that you are worthy and that money is used for political purposes and that becomes part of your decision That's about right. where you can, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, it's, a, it's just a bad, if you care about the religious uh if you care about the religious community at writ large, it's hard to believe that you would do this to them. Um, and that's what scares me, because I don't think uh, our president understands that. No. And there's a good question as to whether or not anybody who does understand that can get his ear. Wow. I mean, that's true. you start that's putting uh, it's an I mean, you start putting your unqualified children who have experience in real estate and jewelry marketing into senior advisor positions. Mm -hmm. You know, people who run right wing websites and like when those when that becomes the quality of the people that you surround yourself with, when you run yourself as a ruling family rather than as somebody who's got mm -hmm. who's, you know, rationalizing the reasonable arguments on either side of an issue and bringing them to your attention so that you can make informed decisions on behalf of the country. Mm -hmm. Like there's a reason that the White House staff is the White House is basically designed to be a machine that produces excellent information for the purposes of presidential decision making. Mm -hmm. When you undo that and instead just make it a, um, <laughs> not to pick on Uzbekistan, but like an <laughs> Uzbekistan <laughs> style, you know, ruling family, sort of kleptocracy organized uh, um, 
you know, a, a, a place where people demonstrate their loyalty, if not their family ties. There's a cost to that, which is, do you hear from people who you need to hear from before making decisions that can really hurt the country? And this is one of those examples. Who's gonna, who, who can get close to him on this issue? Who is smart on this issue and understands the potentially catastrophic consequence of this thing that sounds good when you run it on a bumper sticker? Rachel, where are we going? I, I mean, what's gonna happen with all of this chaos uh, that we find in, in the White House, the conflict that we find in the nation. Where are we going? Where do you, I, 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 this is the kind of question I'd ask you. <laughs> Where do you, I ask you first. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent rejoinder. Uh, you got me there. You did, in fact. I don't know. I mean, I know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in what the country is doing. Um, I am watching like a hawk in terms of what the new administration is doing. I don't feel like I have well-informed expectations as to where we're going to go as a, uh, you know, as a Congress, for example, or in terms of the regulatory agencies, just because there's no previous (laughs) experience like this that we can extrapolate from in our country. Mm -hmm. We are in new territory. But I feel like I know, I know what America is about. I know what the American dream is. I know what American patriotism is like. I know what civic engagement looks like. I know what political power looks like. Um, that's why I said I'm so interested to see if there's going to be accountability for law breaking. You know, yeah. if there's going to be, I, I want to, I, I know the way things work in this country. I want to know if our political system is still going to work to correct things when they go wrong. And that's the test we're in. Where's your hope come from? Um, I'm inspired right now. I mean, I can tell. Yeah, you know, I don't feel, uh, I don't, I don't feel enervated. I really don't. I, you know, I, I, people say like, oh, who you, who do you think is a big deal in terms of the opposition to Trump? Like, who's the next political leader? Who ought to run in 2020? I have no idea. Even if you just look at electoral politics, the Democratic Party right now is no longer the Democratic Party of the Obama era. Mm-hmm. It's the Democratic Party of the Trump era, mm-hmm. which calls for a very different kind of smarts yeah. and leadership and skill and strategy. And um, and I don't know who's going to be the captain of that team. I don't know who's going to emerge as the natural leader. Mm-hmm. Already, the, the household names in terms of opposition to the Trump administration and the worst aspects of what they're trying to do. Already the household names are people who we did not talk about in your average household six months ago. I mean, who knew who Sally Yates was? Who knew? And she's not a partisan player, but she became this incredibly important person in terms of correction to what was going on in Washington. Adam Schiff is now one of the highest profile Democrats in the country because he's got this intelligence role and because he's behaving in a way that is, uh, I think, both in sp- confidence inspiring, but also upstanding mm-hmm. in a lot of people's eyes. Um, you know, I don't, I think the, you know, we were all fascinated in democratic politics by Bernie versus Hillary. Yeah. I'm no longer all that interested in Bernie versus <laughs> Hillary. Um, <laughs> and yeah. at some point, you know, d- different fights call for different fighters. Yeah. And um, we're in a profound period of change, and it's bringing out the best in a lot of people. I, I'm glad you see that. I uh, you got to remember, I live in Louisiana. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I see a lot of people who say to me, uh, I don't have any hope. Uh, I don't know where we're going, but I think it's bad. I've had no telling how many people say to me, I don't even watch the news anymore. Yeah. I can't stand to watch the news. It just depresses me. Um, some people say I'm so cynical that I can't think straight about what the country's doing and, and what's going on. Um, and I have to say that I'm, I'm where I was with you uh, when I told you that day uh, that I'm scared. I'm worried mm-hmm. about our country because... The, the leadership doesn't seem to have the orientation to the Constitution uh, that is essential uh, for our nation. And uh, I, I just I see a lot of blurry places that I wish were uh, a little more clear about what's going on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm saying all that to say, I want you to tell me, and I want our listeners to over hear what you say to me 
um, how should we get through this period of time? Do not allow yourself the luxury of tuning out. I mean, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. This is a really good time to take care of yourself and your family and your loved ones. You know, figure out who, who needs help. Watch out for people in terms of who seems to be sliding. I think people are having, um, experiencing a lot of personal stress and ennui and mental health issues. And I mean, that's, that's real. Um, and especially as it sort of wears on into not just days, but weeks and months. And as we're going to get into years of this, um, it, people are going to people who are very profoundly worried and have anxiety about it. That takes a physical toll on you. Yeah. And we're going to have to watch out for that and take care of each other. But while doing that, don't check out. This is not a time to stop paying attention. In the future, if you stop paying attention right now, you will regret it. Yeah. <laughs> this is a time to, you may not want to, you know, watch every bit of it. And you may not want to watch the parts of it that are the most hard for you to take as an individual, whatever they are. But pick parts of it that you are going to watch. You know, if it's the EPA, pay attention every day to the EPA. If it is your, if your local member of Congress is pushable on something where you want to push them, or if they don't seem pushable and they are diametrically opposed to where you think they ought to be on something, figure out ways to make them pushable on it. Um, if you, you know, don't have, uh, if, if you've got a, if, if you're a Republican, you've got a Republican party in your district that does not reflect your Republican mm -hmm. values, change your local Republican party. If you're a Democrat and your Democratic party locally doesn't reflect your values or it's weak or absent, change that. Work it, work it. This is the time to do it. You never thought of yourself as a political activist? Well, you are now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I think there's, there's a call to citizenship right now, to earnest Great. citizenship, that um, I'm, in, I, I'm inspired to see people responding to it. And I'm inspired to see people say like, I never, I never saw myself this way before, but I wanna be able to tell my kids I did something right yeah. at this time. Um, and Rachel, so do it. You know, I, I have said up. this to you before in private, and I want to say it on the air. Um, there are a lot of people count on you. Mm. And there are a lot of people who find hope just in hearing you show up every night. Mm. Really, that's true. And uh, a close friend said to me, and you I was doing this interview today, that interview will be good for the radio show but it'll also be good for the nation mm. and I thank you oh thank you Walton I uh I I uh I feel that <laughs> uh because you are saying it I also uh I feel like I am I, you know I meet people on the subway I meet people on the street I meet people in Massachusetts when I go home and I am People look me in the eye and tell me not exactly that, but have told me um, that I'm helping my presence in doing this job is helping them kind of hold hold on to things right now. And I, part of me wants to say that's a gossamer thread, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like hold on to something stronger. Um, but I, I'm also trying to be humble about it and hear it and to uh, be worthy of that um, of that faith. So thank you for saying that. There's no better better to call us to a renewed kind of responsible citizenship yeah. than Rachel Matt. Oh. Thank you so well, much. Thanks, my friend. Okay. Thank you.